Amen. Are you there in First John? First John chapter three. Title of the message this afternoon is "How to Be Pure." How to be pure, and we typically think about that phrase and think about like sexual purity or how how not to sin and and uh, different things. And obviously, I could preach a message slightly different uh, direction. We could go with that. Uh, but, you know, I think about this pure, the word pure, and I think, you know, that's kind of a relative term. I mean, yeah, somebody, I mean, if somebody gives you some water and says, this is just pure water, right? Well, how pure is pure? It's kind of relative. I mean, you could dig down deep and find some, you know, uh, different impurities that are in there. Uh, you know, when, when somebody says pure, you know, that's kind of subject to, to your, your, your mind, you know, to, to whatever you think uh, purity would be. But when we talk about somebody being pure in the sense of being without sin or whatever, you think anybody's really pure? <laughs> yeah, nobody's really pure, you know, and I think about that. The Bible talks about this in the sense of perfection, right? And the Bible says, have you considered my servant Job that he's a perfect man? I think, whoa, perfect? He can't be perfect, right? Nobody's perfect. So it seems like a little bit sub subjective. And so, uh, but if you notice here in this text here in verse 3, it says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Now, again, could we ever be pure as Jesus? Absolutely not. Now, that's the goal. We want to strive for perfection like he's perfect. That's the goal is we want to follow him and all that. But, but when I think about uh, many times when the Bible says uh, something like that, man, you know, it's just like it seems un unattainable. And it is unobtainable. And so we, we, we've got to uh, uh, recognize that, that this is the goal. The goal is that we want to uh, purify ourselves now. Now, why would the Bible even say that we need to purify ourselves? I mean, uh, doesn't, you know, once we get saved, aren't we technically pure? You know, in, in spirit, I think in a manner of speaking, we are pure in the sense that otherwise we wouldn't be able to go to heaven. So God looks at us once we're saved and says, that, that man's perfect, that man's pure. But that's the inner man. That's the, that's the part that's not going to die and, and, and be uh, uh, put into the ground. Because God knows good and well that we are corruptible. We are corruptible. And so, you know, I love the 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And in 1st John, it talks a lot about, you know, don't sin. Stay away from sinning, you know. And, and then it will and then it's love the brethren and all these kinds of things. But then it'll say, but if any sin... You know, let him ask the Father. So it's like this understanding. God knows we're human. Now, I'm not trying to give people excuses, but, but isn't this true? He knows. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. He knows that this is the... Obviously, this is something we want to avoid, but this is where mankind is headed in his natural state. Uh, just not too long ago, I started preaching a series on Wednesdays about animals in the Bible. And I started out, this is really stuck with me. It's something I, I just think about a lot now. But uh, I talked about how the fact that men are animals, right? And in our, in our natural state without Christ, we're really no better than any of the animals. So in that way, the atheist and the evolutionist got it right. <laughs> we are. Without, without God, we are just like the animals. And, uh, and so here, that's why there's a lot of passages in the Bible that kind of compare us to animals. And here's a great passage, 2 Peter 2, look at verse 22. 2 Peter 2, verse 22 says, But it happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. And really in our natural state, that's, that's where we're headed. You know, even though, even though we've been saved... And spiritually, we cannot uh, lose that salvation. We're sealed into the day of redemption. But our body is not much better than the animals. And the body is going to do just like the dog does. And it's going to return to those unclean things. It's going to return to the vomit. I mean, that picture is so great, this dog. Because you think about it, the dog, it ate something. And that thing that it ate made it sick. 
you know, it smelled that, said, oh man, that, that, that looks good, man, I want that, and it ate it and it made it sick. But there's nothing inside it that says, you know what, I need to stay away from that because it makes me sick. No, what's he do? He looks at the vomit that he threw up himself and says, oh, yeah, it still looks good. <laughs> he goes and he gets it again. So I mean, it sounds disgusting, but that's what we do with sin in our life. The things that would destroy us, and if we really stopped and wrote down what it did to us before, we'd say, man, I never want to go back. I never want that to happen again. But in our natural state, we tend to go right back to it. Okay, and so God knows that we're that way. He knows that we are corruptible flesh. Thankfully, we're saved by the incorruptible Word of God. Thankfully, the man, uh, the inner man is, is incorruptible, right? That's why he can look at us and say that we're, uh, we're saved. But naturally, we're going to want to go back to that. But God also knows this, that as we grow in the Lord, I think most people in here can probably testify to this, as we grow in the Lord, we will desire to be clean. We have actually, as we grow in the Lord, now in our natural state, we want to get dirty. We want to be like the pig. You know, who cares if I've been washed up? I want to go roll around the dirt some more. But as we grow, we think, well, what can I do to stop being that way? What can I do to, to get, uh, you know, these things out of my life, these things that keep tripping me up? And, and, and what can I do to this? So, so God knows that a believer is going to want that. He knows that a believer is going to need that advice because we're naturally going to fall. And so God puts a lot of places in the Bible where he says, this is how you purify yourself. This is how you get clean. This is how you get those things out of your life. Yeah, we're not going to talk about it like, oh, yeah, go ahead and do that. It's not a big deal. We're going to talk about it like you're a Christian. You shouldn't do that. That's disgusting. How could you even call yourself a Christian if you do those kinds of things? Look, that's what hard preaching does. And it causes some people to say, oh, man. Am I even saved? <laughs> well, yes, you are, but we're not going to just like, you know, contrary to what some people say, we don't just give a license to sin. It's not just like, oh, come on, keep on sinning. Who cares? Uh, the grace of God will abound the more you sin. We know what Paul says about that, right? God forbid. You know, how sh why should we continue in sin? And so, so we as Christians, we begin to grow and we say, how can I conquer this? How can I get better uh, about this? And so, so in this chapter, what we see is, back to 1 John there, in this chapter what we see is the things that will make us impure, and we see the things that will make us pure, okay? So I'm going to start in that, that order. First of all, what makes us impure? Now obviously in the sense of holiness, in the sense of uh, trying to be perfect, trying to walk like Christ, What's going to make us impure is sin, all right? So look at verse 4. It says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So when we preach, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, you know, well, what is a sin? Well, sin is basically just breaking God's commandments, right? Any law that God gave us when we break that and we fall short of what He expected from us because He expects perfection, no, we're not ever going to reach that, but, we, but he expects that, and that's what he's going to judge us according to. So, uh, uh, so, so, so whenever we find out uh, that we are not perfect, what are we going to do about it? So uh, the transgression of the law, verse 4, and then here, here's some other verses about impurity. What makes us impure? Now, I'm about to read some, what I would say, some very hard passages from the book of 1 John. Look at verse 6. I mean, you've already read them and, and considered them, but you, can you understand why somebody who's not grown in their faith might even be saved, but they haven't grown in their faith, they haven't learned a whole lot, and they'll read 1 John and say, those verses kind of scare me. Those verses kind of make me wonder if you can lose your salvation. Look, somebody can be saved. Now, now I don't think somebody can get saved where when they got saved, they they thought that they could lose their salvation. Does that make sense? Because they were trusting in their works. Otherwise, they wouldn't think, you know, that they could lose their salvation. But I do think there's people out there that they get saved and they're confused on this topic and they hear all this really bad preaching and think, oh, can I lose my salvation? How many people have you knocked on the door and said, you know, we, we, all, we ask them that follow-up question, you know, and say, well, do you think there's anything you can do to lose your salvation? And sometimes we're like, I don't think so. <laughs> that person is probably saved. They're just like... They're a little bit confused on that. Like, I've heard so many people say there, there's di different things, like uh, somebody said suicide, and what's that all about, you know? But they're just kind of confused. All right, so, so these verses, though, will trip somebody up who's not completely 
you know, grown on that and not understanding of this. But when we read 1 John, uh, I already touched on this, so I'm not going to go back and re-preach it. But what we need to know is he's talking to believers. And he's saying he separates us very clearly all throughout the 1 John. He separates kind of us from them. And you got the world, but you're not of the world. You know, you're the Christians, you're the saved ones, and you live in this world. And so, uh, so there's definitely a distinguishing uh, uh, part. He, he's talking to believers. But look at uh, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now, if somebody asked you, hey, are you abiding in Christ? I hope you would say yes, because you're saved. <laughs> you abide in him, right? You're not going to lose your salvation. But whenever you read this, you're like, whoa, if I abide in him, you know, that means I'm not going to sin. Well, that's true. If you, if you are completely in, abiding in him, you're not going to sin. Unfortunately, we don't always completely abide in him in the in the flesh. OK, and so, uh, again, spiritually, yes, we're sealed into the day of redemption. But verse six here uh, is a is a hard ver verse to hear because it's asking you, are you abiding in him? You know, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Do you know the Lord? Well, yeah, of course I do. I know him as my personal savior. I know him, you know, you know what I'm saying? We would always answer, yes, I know him. But this verse just kind of like smacks you in the face and says, if you know him, you know, you're not going to sin. Verse 7 says, little children. Now, again, who's he talking to? Save people. You know, he's little children. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Are you righteous? Well, I would like to say I'm righteous, right? As it might be your thought. I'd like to say I'm righteous. I mean, I am a Christian, right? Now, a lot of people, you knock on the door again. Are you going to heaven? Well, yeah, I'm a good person. I've tried to follow the commandments. I've tried to love my neighbor. I've tried to do all these things, and they'll give you all these works. We understand that's not what gets us to heaven. But if someone said, are you righteous? We might say, like, well, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to live right. I'm trying to do good things. Uh, all right. And so, uh, but we read this and it says, look, if you're righteous, let me read it again. Verse seven, uh, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Are, are you of the devil? No way. I'm of the Lord, right? I'm of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. But when you sin, guess what? That's something that people do that are of the devil. And so, uh, and so we understand uh, what's being said here is just it, it's just really a slap in the face. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen for that. <laughs> I mean, without Christ, we would have no hope. We understand that for sure. But boy, these are these are some hard verses. Look at verse nine and ten. Are you born of God? Of course I am. Born again. Born of God. Born, you know, born of the Spirit. Look at verse nine. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. That's a hard verse, because you look at that and it says, that sounds like if you sin, then you're not saved. But we understand that that's not what it's talking about. It's just saying, look, if you are a believer, right? If you are a Christian, there is no reason that you should continue in sin. You're born of God. You know, you're a righteous man. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 again. Different verse. I'm, I'm glad these hard passages, these aren't contradictions, but these hard passages can usually be answered by looking at another passage of Scripture, right? Thankfully, God did that. 2 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 7. And delivered just Lot. Just is a kind of a synonym of righteousness. Somebody is justified. Somebody who is, is uh, pure in God's eyes. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now, if you read that without going back to Genesis... You know, you'd say, man, he must have been a good guy, a lot, man, you know, no sin found in him whatsoever. But if you read Genesis, you see this guy wasn't, 
<laughs> wasn't always a great guy. And not only, was, not only do we know by the story that he made some gross mistakes and some bad behavior, but we even see the testimony of his, his uh, uh, sons-in-law who, you know, whenever he's telling them, hey, we need to get out of here, they're just laughing like, what are you talking about? I mean, there's so many things about Lot that we say, there's no way this could have been a righteous man, yet God himself says he was righteous. And these sinners in this wicked world vexed his, sin, his sinful soul. Now look, even good, hopefully well-intentioned uh, believers are going to come up to you and they're going to say, whenever you call somebody wicked, they're going to say, wait, 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 you're a sinner too, right? You're just as wicked as those people. No, that's not really true, <laughs> okay? We don't, are we all sinful? Are we all corruptible? Are we all capable of doing sins? Oh, absolutely. We all know that. But we try to live in this mindset where we're growing in our desire to not sin. We're growing in our desire to be purified and to cleanse ourselves, okay? And so we're growing in that desire. So we're not just going to walk right arm in arm with people who are living wickedly, you know, and people are doing all manners of, of wickedness and act like, oh, yeah, hey, we're all sinners. You know, let's just go hang out at the bar, <laughs> you know, because there's one sinner to another. Let me tell you about Jesus. Like, that's not what the Bible, the Bible, God expects a whole lot more out of us than that. And so, uh, and so, so we, there has to be straightforward preaching. God's not going to, uh, you know, he'll look at one person and say, this is a, this is my child. I see him as righteous. I see him as holy. He finds grace in my eyes, right? Like Noah, you know, everybody has a, a, a mom and a dad, uh, maybe different stories. I don't know how your life is, but most people have a mom and dad that are proud of them and they don't care what they do. I mean, you can go out, steal a car, get thrown in jail, and they'll be like, well, he's a good kid, <laughs> right? Every mom and dad, you know, can see past that. They, they, they want to see what's good. And I feel kind of like God's like that. Like, well, if you're a believer, man, he knows you're his child. And he, and, he, and, he, and he sees the blood of Christ and he's able to kind of overlook some things. I don't understand uh, how that works. We all know our capability. We know in our natural state, we're just like a dog, just like a pig, right? But God sees us as better than that. And don't compare me to the wickedness of the world. Don't compare me to the sodomite down the road or, or compare me to, you know, the drunkard or, or hey, look, that's not me. Now, do I sin? Of course I sin, but that's beside the point. <laughs> I'm a Christian and I'm walking, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to serve the Lord. I'm wanting to live righteous. God sees me as righteous. Like there's different. There's us and there's them. There's the sinners and there's the righteous. Oh, we're all sinners. Yeah, well, the Bible distinguishes between the two, right? We, 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 are, not, we are not sinners in the sense of our title, who we are, who we represent. We are in Christ, okay? We abide in Christ. And so, uh, so you understand why these verses are, are, are really hard. But we're born of God, and, uh, and, and, God and, and we should be growing in our desire to be clean. What did we just read? Verse, uh, what did we read? Oh, yeah, okay, we're talking about just Lot. Okay, lost my place there for a minute. Okay, so that's just a little bit about what makes us impure. We understand that. We understand that. I mean, we understand I can drink purified water and, you know, some expert out there is going to tell you, no, actually, there's no such thing as pure water. It's got something in it. It's got some microbes. <laughs> you know, it's got some different things in it. You can't filter out the fluoride. You can't filter out certain metals. I don't know. Somebody's going to do that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, like purity is relative, but the goal is to be as pure as possible, all right? So how then do we accomplish that? What makes us pure? And that's what this passage is talking about. Back to 1 John. We looked a little bit about what makes us impure. We understand that. Those are the things that we should hate. We don't want to do those things. We don't want to break God's commandments. We don't want to uh, walk after the flesh. But here are the things that will make us pure. Uh, look at, look at, hold, hold your place there because we're coming back, but look over to John. The gospel according to John. And, and understand this, that when we talk about purity, when we talk about purifying ourselves, we certainly don't mean that we need to get saved all over again. That, that, that would actually not even make sense because we wouldn't be purifying ourselves, then we would just be starting all over from scratch, Right? Well, that guy's gone, so I got to get saved again. 
Oh, that guy messed up. I got to get saved again. That, that would be a whole, whole uh, entirely different thing. When we purify ourselves, we're taking what messed up, what fell into sin, what got spotted, and we're cleaning it up again, right? So this is a great example. John chapter 13. <clears throat> now, before the, pe <laughs> before the feast of the Passover, the feast of the Passover, what Jesus knew, uh, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world, uh, uh, out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from the supper. And laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. After that he poureth water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherein he is girded. When uh, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Now let's stop there for a minute. <clears throat> we often hear this passage talked about how Jesus was just showing himself to be a servant. And there's that application's there. You know, he would take time to humble himself and wash the feet of his lowly disciples, his servants, right? And so there's a, there's a sense in which that, uh, that is an application that could be made. But, you know, I think there's a greater application as we continue to read this about what G God is teaching us here. Amen. Look at verse uh, 7 again. Jesus answers unto him, what, uh, no, where, where did I leave off? Okay, six. He cometh to Simon Peter. Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. He shut, he shut Peter up. <laughs> Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. All right. If you're going to say that I have no part in you, if I don't, well, then wash all of me, right? And so we understand the, the, what he's saying. Jesus is saying, look, you don't understand what I'm doing right now. You're going to understand. There's a picture here. There's something I'm trying to show you. And then he gets there uh, uh, to, to, to wash him, and he says, oh, you're not going to wash me. And Jesus said to him, he that is washed, because now Peter said, well, just wash all of me. And he says, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet. But as clean every whit, ye are clean, but not all. Now, we know he started this chapter off talking about Judas Iscariot. And he goes on and talks about him a little bit more. What he's saying is there is one among you who's not clean. I said, now, all of you have feet that are going to get dirty. <laughs> you walk outside barefoot. You know, I do it all the time. Forgot my keys or forgot something in the car and I got to go get it. And I don't want to put my shoes on. So I run outside barefoot, come back in. Well, that was dumb. I should have put some shoes on because now my feet are dirty. I got to go wash my feet. Right. It's easy to get your feet dirty. And so Jesus is saying, look, I don't have to clean all of you all again. I don't if I just got out of the shower, then I run out uh, to get the mail or, or get something out of the car and I get a little bit dirty on my feet. I don't have to come back in the house and say, oh, got to go take a shower again. Right? No, just clean your feet. You're clean. Right? Now, I realize all illustrations break down at some point, but do you see the picture being put there? It's like when you're saved, you don't have to get saved again. You just have to come to Jesus, and he's going to wash you up. He's going to clean you up. He's going to purify those little impurities uh, that are there. And that's the continual life of a believer. But he said, hey, but there's one of you that's not clean. And he's talking about Judas Iscariot, very clearly talking about the fact that he's not saved. Okay, and so he says that was the case uh, from the beginning. And he says, but you, you got to get your feet washed. And then, uh, and then uh, he said, you're not, uh, he said, verse 11, for ye know, for he knew who should betray him. Wherefore, he said, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so am I. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an, an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. Now, we can get that. There is an application there for sure. Hey, we should serve one another. There's also another application there that, you know, we as believers, what we need to do is try to help keep each other clean. 
We need to help each other to be clean. Amen. And you know how do we do that? Sometimes by the Word of God, we've got to preach something that's hard for somebody to hear so that they'll stay clean. Amen. Not that we don't think that they're saved. We just say, hey, man, you got a little dirt on your feet. Let me help you wash that out. It's kind of like remove the beam out of your eye so you can help your brother remove the moat out of his eye, right? So we have to, uh, uh, we have to clean our own feet. <laughs> we don't clean our feet. Jesus cleans our feet. But you know what I mean. We make sure our feet are clean. And then we got to say, hey, you know, let me wash your feet for you. I think that's a pretty neat uh, uh, application there. So, <clears throat> so we understand that purifying yourself doesn't, doesn't mean you're getting saved again. Purifying just means you got sin. Now you have to go to the Lord and, and, and try to clean that up, okay? So the question was, what makes us pure? Let's read verse 1 and 2 again, 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved... I mean, see how he's just, he's calling, he's saying, uh, you know, what manner the love the Father hath bestowed upon us. That's different than them, right? And he says, beloved, that's brother, that's the brethren he's talking about. That's those who are saved. They're in, they're in the beloved. Now look, if an unsaved person stands before Jesus, he's going to say, I never knew you. The Christians, it's not their how pure they are that is going to allow them to stand before God, right? It's the fact that they're his children. But he's talking to the, but we're talking to the children, the believers, and we're saying, uh, you know, that you need to be clear, uh, clean. Look at verse 2 again. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. You know, we're not completely like him now. <laughs> we want to try to be like him, but... You know, one day we're going to be like him and uh, for we shall see him as he is. And I think that's more than just like physically seeing him with our eyeballs. We're going to understand his heart and his mind and who he is and what his purpose are better than we ever understood. Because we can never understand that in this flesh. But one day we'll see him, we'll know him, we'll understand him as he is. And every man, look, here's the main verse here. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. So when we realize some certain things, then, uh, then we are purifying ourselves. Okay, have this hope doesn't mean like, man, I sure hope I'm saved. I sure hope that when I die, I'm going to heaven. I mean, how many times you hear that at the door? You know, you going to heaven? I hope so. Well, that's not the hope he's talking about. Okay, when the Bible talks about hope, having your hope in Christ, it's, a, it's actually an assurance. It's saying, I know that I'm saved, and I, and I stand upon this hope, right? right? This hope that one day uh, I will be in heaven, one day I'll be with Christ. And, I, and where do we get that hope? Well, it's faith. It's faith in God's Word. We heard the Word, we believed it, said, okay, I'm putting my hope in this Word. Okay, and so we have to uh, stand fast on that. And he says this, he says, when you hope on or you, or you realize and believe these things, uh, you purify yourself. Here are some things. Number, uh, look at verse 5. Here are some things that we need to know, okay, and, and to remember and, and, and reckon in ourselves. Ye know that He was manifested to take away your sins, and in Him is no sin. Okay, we understand that. Hey, look, we've been born again. We are called the sons of God, verse 1. Praise the Lord. We understand that. And so because we know that we are saved, we trusted in Christ, and we've been born again, now we have to realize that, and we have to come back and say, uh, you know, I have been saved from that, you know, from who I was. And so uh, what, what verse did I just tell you to? I, mean, I keep getting distracted. Verse 5. And you know, so here's what we have to remember. We have to remember that God was manifested to take away our sins, right? God, Jesus came down, 100% God, 100% man, right? That was the miracle of it. That was, he, that's why he's the only one that could, could cover our sins and take away our, uh, take away our sins, because he became sin for us who knew no sin, all right? So, so, so we have to remember that. We have to remember, hey, it's not like just, you know, that's not a powerful thing. That, that's, that's, our, that's what our hope is based on, the fact that he, we have forgiveness of sins through what he did for us. 
And now when we remember that, man, that's, that's, that's really freeing, that I'm no longer, I no longer have to live in sin. Right? He died for that. I don't have to pay for that. I mean, because it's almost like if you thought you were going to go, if you knew you were going to go to hell, I, de- I mean, if you knew 100%, and I'm going to hell, maybe you just totally decided to reject it. You knew that, you, you knew that it was true, but you said, I don't, want, I don't want anything to do with that. You rejected it. Now you know you're going to go to hell. Do you think you would live the rest of your life still living as pure as you can and trying to be holy and live according to the Lord? No. And that's why people, God just gives them over to a reprobate mind because they're like, man, I know I'm, you know, I, I know I'm not going to heaven anyway. So they just do all manner of just trying to fulfill the flesh and all that kind of stuff. And so we remember this, that no, 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 actually Jesus paid for all those sins, Amen. right? I, I'm not going to have to pay for all those sins anymore. And that actually purifies us and, want, and, and helps us to want to live holy and want to live righteous, uh, righteous because he's our father, you know. We want, to, we, we want to glorify the Father. Amen. And so, uh, uh, let me see here. When, uh, number, let, let's look at verse 5 again. We know that he was without sin. I already mentioned that. Look at verse 8. Verse 8, I love that, that verse. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. <clears throat> for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. We don't have to live in fear of what the devil's going to do to us because of our sins or, or how he's seeking to devour us or whatever. Man, we put on the shield of faith. We put on the helmet of salvation. We take up the sword, uh, uh, the, the word of God, the sword of the spirit. And we, and we try to live unto God because he already defeated the devil. <clears throat> now, I realize the devil still alive and well right now and wreaking all kinds of havoc in our world. But we understand that the end's already been written and that we do, through Jesus Christ, we do conquer that because he has defeated the enemy. It says that he was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Right? We're on the winning side. That's something that we should be excited about and we should live as though we are on the right side because we are uh, on the right side. So... When we realize these things, we begin to pure ourselves. Here's another thing. When we realize that the world that didn't receive him is not going to receive us, that gives us a little more strength that, hey, you know, when I, because some, a, lot of our sin is, is, a lot of our sin is based on just the fact that we want to gratify ourselves. I understand that. But a lot of our sin is based on the fact that, you know, we still try to live in the world. And so we still have other people, influences in our life, friends, family members or whatever. And, uh, and so we kind of feel like, man, I got to keep them happy or, oh, I don't want them to think bad about me. Well, the, dev- the Bible makes it very clear that uh, those people are actually living for the devil. The devil is leading their lives. And so naturally they're going to hate us whenever we try to follow Christ because they hate Christ. Right. And so it said there in verse, uh, uh, verse one, it said, therefore, the world knoweth us not. Because it knew him not. And when we remember that and we think about that, it actually helps purify us. It helps keep us clean because we're remembering, hey, they didn't like Jesus either. So I'm going to live holy life. And if they don't like me, guess what? I can be happy about that. Say, I'm being just like my father. Right. Right? I keep saying father and Jesus, you understand. I'm not I'm not a oneness (laughs) guy. But we're glorifying the father. And that's what Jesus's goal was. Right. And that's what his uh, his purpose was here is that we might glorify him. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> verse, uh, verse 2, we need to realize this. He's going to appear again. He's going to come back. You say, oh, yeah, well, <clears throat> what do they say in First in Peter? They said there's scoffers out there that say, oh, yeah, where is the return, right? No, 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 we have the hope. We understand he's coming back. Yeah. And so what does it say, verse <clears throat> 2? Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Praise the Lord for that. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, for we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Now, people might laugh at you and say, what, you think Christ is coming back? You really think he's coming back? Yep, I do. (laughs) And as long as I keep remembering that, keep thinking about that, it's going to cause me to purify myself and want to live for the Lord. You know what I'm doing? Washing my feet, you know, or Jesus is washing my feet, you know, and and, and I'm being cleaned by the word. The Bible talks about that. We need to realize uh, that we are going to see him again. We're going to understand and we're going to 
uh, see him as he is. <clears throat> so, what will things begin to be like then when we're purified? Well, naturally. I mean, we already know what they're going to be. That's the things that we're reminding ourselves. So, number one, look at verse 13. The world's going to hate us. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. <clears throat> we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love our brethren. He that loveth not his brother, I'm getting ahead of myself, abideth in death. So, first of all, just go back and marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. I, uh, in, in Iola, I preached this morning on things that Jesus marveled at. All right? Things that wish Jesus marveled <laughs> I did that one for my daughter. Okay, so things at which Jesus marveled. All right, you, marvel means it astonished him. It kind of blew his mind. And you think, well, how can anything blow Jesus' mind? Well, there's two times the Bible says that Jesus marveled at something. Number one, he marveled at their unbelief. Right, he looked at those who who should have known better, and they they just weren't accepting him. They weren't receiving him. They didn't have belief, and it, and he marveled at that. And then there's another time where there's a Gentile, a uh, Roman centurion, and he sends his servants to go tell Jesus, you know, hey, my servant is sick. If you'll just say the word, he'll be healed. And, and he says, hey, I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. So just say it. And, and, I'll be, and it says Jesus marveled at that man's faith. So he marvels at those who have no faith. Right. Which is a lot. <laughs> right. And all those majority of the Jews that he originally had had sought after as he's walking about the, like, the lost sheep, you know, and he's trying to preach to them. He's like, I marvel at their unbelief. But then at the same hand, he sees this centurion and he's got this great faith, which stands above all those others. And he says, man, I marvel at that. Right. So anyway, just a little second secondary message. <laughs> but the marvel. Right. Is what we're talking about. Just like, wow, I'm just scratching my head at that. So here's what Jesus said, or, or John said. He said, don't marvel that the world hates you. You shouldn't be like, I just don't understand why they hate me. I try to be a nice guy. I try to live for the Lord. I try to do right. Why do they hate me? Don't marvel at that. <laughs> he already told you they're going to hate you, right? And that should help you to purify yourself because you know that when you walk with him, you're going to endure all that. It kind of prepares you. You're ready for it, okay? And so that's what we can expect to happen once we're purified. The other thing is, and I kind of already read some of this, but let's look at verse 14 through verse 20. Another thing is, when we're purified, we begin to love our brethren. You know, that doesn't mean, you know, that we're always going to have this perfect love for one another and, and, and for our brethren. But that should be a result of when we have cleaned up sin out of our life. And we get some uh, some of these things out of our out of our life. We should begin to love our brother. Look at verse fourteen. <clears throat> we know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Right now, look. We are not children of death. We are not children of the wrath of God. We are not. You know. We are all, understand. We have eternal life because we put our faith in Jesus. So we have to make this mental, uh, this mental realization that, look, we are not supposed to act as though we are still dead, like the world is dead. We have eternal life, okay? So, uh, but when we hate our brothers, uh, then actually what we're doing is, is well, we're at least appearing that we are abiding in death. And physically speaking, in this flesh, we are abiding in death. Verse 15, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Jesus talked about that, right? If you already committed murder in your heart, if you hate your brother. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So can you find any verses in the Bible where somebody killed somebody and still went to heaven? Yeah, you can. <laughs> right? So he's not saying, look, if you, there's not going to be anyone in heaven that ever committed a murder. He's just saying that that is not what a Christian looks like. Christians don't murder, and just like you wouldn't expect a whole bunch of murderers to be in heaven because that's not the Christian thing to do, you shouldn't expect a whole bunch of people that hate their brothers right, to be in heaven. And again, I understand the, the, the spirit. I'm going to get to that verse in a minute, okay? But the, the, the soul is what's saved, okay? But we shouldn't expect somebody who loves the Lord, who has been saved, 
to, to hate their brother any more than we would expect them to be murderers and all that stuff. Okay, so verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever hath this world's good and seeth his brother have, have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. This is what James talks about. Now, a lot of Christians want to go to James and say, look, James is saying, you know, it's works. You know, I understand it's faith, but the faith is going to cause works. So you're just, if you don't have works, then you're not saved or whatever. That's actually not what James is saying. James is just saying, look, if you say that you have faith, that doesn't do anybody any good. <laughs> that doesn't profit anything in this earth for you to just go around saying, I've got faith. But what you need to do is you need to demonstrate your faith through your works. Amen. And so Christians should be expected to do good works, Amen. right? They're not relying on that for their salvation, but they should be expecting that. Uh, they should be expected to do that. Okay, so the world's going to hate us. But then also, once we purify ourselves, we begin to love the brethren. Now, I don't know about you, but... There's a lot of places that we could go. We could party. We could be, you know, we could go to different uh, friends' houses or whatever of the world. Maybe you work with some coworkers, have bosses or whatever. You could go out and fellowship with them. That's nothing like fellowshipping with fellow believers, Amen. brothers and sisters in Christ. That's that's fellowship. You know, that's uh, that is good times right there when you love your brethren. And you're fellowshipping with them in Christ. It's just like, man, you feel like you're pure, right? Because that's what we're supposed to be doing. And so, uh, and so that's why the Bible talks about not loving the world, neither the things that are in the world. So uh, the last thing is we will be pleasing in his sight and, he will and we will receive blessings from him. Look at verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. That's the result. Remember, here's what John said he's writing these things for. That your joy may be full. That you will fellowship one with another. And truly our fellowship is with Christ. Right? So he's trying to restore our, our, our joy of our salvation and our fellowship with our brothers and sisters. And, uh, and that we would walk with Christ. We would keep the commandments and all those things. And guess when we do that? God begins answering our prayers in ways that He never would if we were continuing in sin. And He begins to open doors that never would have been opened to us if we were continuing in sin. And they say, well, what about the world, man? They just continue in sin and they get to do whatever they want. Look, there's a big difference. They're not part of the family of God. Amen. You know, we are a part of the family of God, so God's going to chasten us and He's going to discipline us when we do wrong. But look, aren't you glad you're a part of the family of God? <laughs> I, I wouldn't trade that for, man, I don't want him to, uh, to discipline me. I want to be able to get away with whatever I want to get away with. That doesn't make any sense. I would much rather him discipline me whenever I do wrong. But here is the order, okay? Number one, we have to be born again. We have to be saved by believing in Jesus Christ and trusting what, uh, what he did for us. Here's what the Bible says at the end of this verse here, verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that we abide in him by the Spirit which he hath given us. Okay, so first, people just need to believe. They need to put their faith in Jesus. They need to understand how to be born again. They need to understand all that and to enter into that relationship uh, with God. But then the next thing is, and this is the hard part, this is Christianity, okay? Getting saved is so easy. Yep. Christianity is taking the next step and saying, now what? Well, now you need to stay clean. Amen. Now you need to love the brethren. Now you need to do all these things and walk in the Spirit. And when you do, you're reminded daily, hey, I'm a, I'm a Christian. Amen. I've got the Spirit in me. You know, and it's and it just it just kind of regenerates you and helps keep you clean. 
Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, we know that we are washed by the word, clean, cleansed by the word. And so help us to stay continually bathing in the scriptures and helping it to affect our lives and to clean us up. Uh, we know we don't deserve uh, anything. We certainly don't deserve our salvation and our works could never, uh, never gain us salvation. But, but Lord, help us to put in the effort and put in the diligent time uh, that we need to add to our faith and to do the things that you're going to bless and you're going to help us to have joy. You're going to help us be effective in the ministry and reaching other people and having a good testimony. All the things that we know spiritually, the spirit within us tells us these are the things that we need, Lord. So help us uh, to remember that, purify ourselves by remembering these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.